Good morning, everyone. Uh, Aaron Minigan is the Director of Historic Preservation for the Preservation Society of Charleston, the PSC, in South Carolina. In this role, Aaron oversees the PSC's planning and zoning advocacy preservation programs, which further the organization's mission to serve as a strong advocacy leader for citizens concerned about preserving Charleston's distinctive character, quality of life, and diverse neighborhoods. She's previously managed the architectural review boards and oversaw special preservation and planning projects for local governments within the city of Charleston, Charleston St. Augustine. Erin has an undergraduate degree in historic preservation and community planning from the College of Charleston and a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Florida. So we're thrilled to have Erin with us this morning. So everybody join me with a little um, digital applause. That would be great. I'm told I'm muted, but I think some people could hear me. Yeah. All right, I'll turn it over to Erin. Thanks, Mary. I'm really excited to uh, share this presentation today. Um, this is something near to my heart. Um, I was very lucky to be involved with um, developing design guidelines for elevating historic buildings here in Charleston. Um, just a little background on myself. Previous to my position now at the Preservation Society, I did work for the City of Charleston helping manage the Board of Architectural Review. And it was during that role that I did help develop these guidelines. And this was a major shift for the city um, in the way we traditionally review um, architecture and design review for the city. Um, and it was it was a big, it was a big shift in momentum for, for how we do that here. Um, so before I get into that, I did want to talk a little bit about the Preservation Society and what I'm doing currently. Let me get the slide to move forward. There we go. So on April 21st, 1920, Susan Pringle Frost uh, gathered a group of 32 concerned citizens to discuss the Joseph Manigo House pictured here. It's one of our grander homes in Charleston on Meeting Street, constructed in 1802 and one of our earlier buildings as well. Um, it was threatened with demolition to make way for a gas station. Um, and so to prevent that, this group of citizens pulled together their resources and actually purchased the property. And while it was developed into a gas station, the building was saved and it still stands today. Um, this group formally organized as the Society for the Preservation of Old Dwellings, um, later changing their name to the Preservation Society of Charleston. And based on our date of founding, we are the first community-based member-supported preservation organization in the country. And in our formative years, the focus was on saving buildings from demolition and restoring neglected buildings, certainly. Um, for example, the old Planners Hotel at the corner of Queen and Church Streets, pictured here. Um, we convinced the city to deny demolition of this building, and it became a Depression-era works uh, progress administration projects, and it was restored in 1935, still stands today. Um, and also through a combination of purchasing properties and working with other property owners, we restored the famous Rainbow Row um, and actually were the first to paint them the bright colors that they are today. Um, but perhaps our greatest legacy was that the Preservation Society was instrumental in persuading the city to adopt the, the nation's first zoning ordinance with regulations to protect historic resources. This was adopted in 1931. It designated 138 acres as the old and historic district and a board of architectural review to review and approve changes to buildings within that district, um, which you can see here, it really just covered the southernmost tip of Charleston. Um, and since then it has expanded to cover most of the peninsula um, and protects the majority of historic, uh, Charleston's historic buildings today. So now getting into the topic we are here for, flooding. It's uh, really no wonder, looking at historic maps, why his, uh, Charleston floods the way that it does. Uh, this is the Halsey map here, which shows the historic high water line. Um, and much of, much of the western part of the peninsula, as well as portions of the eastern side, were filled in to create developable land. Um, and this is still where we experience the greatest extent of flooding, because water certainly remembers where it wants to go. And this is a bird's eye view map of Charleston, uh, also showing that eroded uh, edge of the western side of the peninsula, which at this point has mostly been filled in out to about this point here. <clears throat> 
So during high tides, we experienced flooded roadways in much, much of our eastern and western edges of the peninsula. Um, in the 1970s, we experienced two days of tidal flooding a year. In 2016, we experienced 50 days, which was a record. And by 2045, the city is predicted to see 180 days of flooding annually, which, which is more than half of the year. Here are some scenes of what we see on a regular basis and cause uh, great interruption and damage on a widespread scale, both to our public infrastructure and private property. Uh, this is Church Street, which historically was a creek. And then these are two images of the western edge of the peninsula. So it is documented that more than one foot rise in water level in the Charleston Harbor has occurred over the last 80 years. And the NOAA expects two and a half to three and a half feet over the next 50 years. But in the most extreme scenario, that could be over five feet. Hurricane Hugo was a historic hurricane that caused significant devastation in 1989. And during that hurricane, the peak crest was over 12 feet and that is projected to be between 19 and 21 feet with similar hurricane conditions in the future. And just to visualize some of these areas on the map, uh, what they look like during times of high tide flooding. And also to visualize the most extreme scenario that I just um, described, at the year 2100, the entirety of the peninsula would be inundated. So surprisingly, with all of that data, uh, the preliminary FEMA flood maps that are uh, projected to go into effect in early 2021 are going down from the current elevation requirements. Uh, the new maps show uh, the majority of the peninsula at AE 10 and 11, uh, currently, most of those areas are at AE 13 and 14. Um, so while these areas are going down, uh, most of our historic homes are still well below those elevation requirements and we will continue to see homes needing to be elevated. So up until recently, the preferred approach to historic homes that tripped the 50% threshold and repair costs therefore needing to be brought up to code, which did include being elevated to FEMA requirements, um, was to seek a FEMA variance. Um, the BAR, the Board of Architectural Review, traditionally would deny elevation requests due to negative impacts to historic material and form and relationship to the streetscape. Um, and that FEMA, uh, that FEMA variance uh, allowed owners to not elevate at all or not have to elevate all the way up to FEMA requirement. Um, so this is a very rare example um, of two homes after Hurricane Hugo that did elevate. They were approved by BAR to elevate, but they only elevated just a few feet, um, not all the way up to what FEMA would require. And to be eligible for a FEMA variance, uh, the home would have to be within and contributing to the National Register Historic District. So this all started to change um, between 2015 and 2017 when we experienced three major storm events, including Hurricane Joaquin, Hurricane Matthew, and uh, Hurricane Irma. Uh, many people would complete repairs to their homes after being flooded just for that home to be flooded again. And it really got to the point where many homes were just left vacant um, because they were no longer habitable and there was no money left for repairs. Um, so this was when the sentiment started changing in the city and there was this move towards supporting elevating historic buildings. The landmark application where it really did change was with this home at 42 Rutledge Avenue. This is a significant building. It's rated two on our architectural inventory, which is a very high significant rating. Um, it was constructed in 1859 and it is, it is a sister house. So there's a lot going toward its significance. Um, in 2017, it actually burned. Um, it, was, uh, it underwent a significant fire um, and then it flooded during Hurricane Irma. Uh, so in response to these events, it, uh, put in a request to not only restore the house, but to elevate at the same time. 
Um, and this was the first opportunity for the BAR to grapple with how to sensitively elevate a historic building. And it really did inform our process going forward. So some creative measures were taken to help mitigate the elevation, um, in particular, the piazza screen, which is this element here, uh, the steps and the railing were all kept right in place, right in its existing location and the house was lifted up above it um, to help mitigate the height change, more riser risers were added interior of the piazza. And other positive moves were made to retain as much historic fabric as possible, including raising the chimneys with the house. Um, so with all of this momentum, the very first, um, you know, uh, real elevation project approved by BAR, uh, we decided as BAR staff that it was time to formally put in place some policies for elevating historic building buildings. Um, so we started off by gathering a group of professionals in the city, um, including architects, contractors, engineers, and preservationists. Um, we gathered them at a public workshop and we hosted a discussion on how to best approach the issue. And there was consensus from everyone that we needed to develop actual design guidelines. Um, so at this workshop, um, we first went through the challenges our built environment presents to elevating buildings. Um, and the foremost issue is our very unique architecture type, which is the single house. This is a very narrow, vertically proportioned building with a side porch called a piazza. The entrance from the street is a faux entrance through the piazza screen, which I just described, um, with the actual entrance a bit further down. And so elevating a building like this, where it's so narrow toward the street, you know, how, how are we gonna be able to maintain its relationship where it's, you know, at a zero lot line, um, that elevation change really could be felt um, significantly with that, with those features. Um, another issue, is in Charleston, uh, we have an architectural rating system, which I alluded to. Um, category ones and twos um, are considered most significant. And the BAR ordinance is actually very restrictive in how um, these are able to be altered. Um, it actually specifically mentions that they must be preserved in situ at all costs, which goes directly against elevating them. Um, luckily, most category one buildings are grander homes, which are already elevated and not in danger of flooding. Um, we've yet to see a category one application come forward, but that was something that we had to discuss. Um, it's also very typical in Charleston for multiple houses on a street to be sisters of each other, built in the same form at the same time. Um, and there's lots of concern about elevating only one sister and losing its relationship with the streetscape. Another indicative Charleston architecture type is the Freedman's Cottage, which is essentially a one story single house. Um, there was concern over elevating the house to such an extent that it totally loses its form and character as well as relationship to the streetscape. And often um, you see uh, Friedman cottages that are sisters of each other, uh, which is like just a double whammy. So then we took a look at buildings that have been elevated or historically elevated to see what approaches have been successful and unsuccessful in our specific urban environment. Um, generally, foundations under the main body of a house are solid, while piers and open screening are used under piazzas and porches. So solid here, open here. Um, historically, many homes in Charleston have raised English basements with habitable space at the ground level, like this. And the panelists at the workshop agreed um, this was a successful approach to have the bottom level appear as another floor, though in contemporary applications uh, will likely be uninhabitable space or garage space. Then we started looking at other approaches to break up the main body of the house from the, the raised base. Uh, strong water tables are successful in providing a linear break. And in this uh, example in particular, uh, the patris plates, which are the exterior parts of earthquake bolts, provide a nice punctuation between the foundation and the first floor. Most foundations in Charleston are either exposed brick or finished in stucco, 
and using a differentiated material on the foundation from the main body of the house, we found to be very successful, especially when they're homes of larger scales like these. And on buildings set back from the street, we often see a raised planter bed and knee wall, which helps hide the height of the foundation and creates a better transition to the street. And finally, openings in the foundation are often screened with decorative iron grates. And in modern construction, we felt this could be a successful way to deal with uh, flood vents, uh, which helps give a functional opening a bit more character. So something we identified as not compatible with Charleston's architectural patterns was beachy style screening and stock lattice, um, which generally we felt to be a low quality and suburban type treatment. And not surprisingly, tall blank foundations do not create a positive pedestrian experience. This would have been a good opportunity to explore introducing fenestration or articulation at the foundation, but instead you have just this giant 10 foot blank wall and a first floor fenestration pattern um, that does not at all relate to the pattern of the historic streetscape. Again, pretty obvious, but front facing garages at the foundation creates a pretty unfriendly pedestrian experience and looks completely foreign to Charleston's historic environment. Um, these houses are actually outside of BAR's purview um, and something that would have not been approved if it went through the design review process. So a few months later, we brought back the panelists for a second workshop to dive a little bit deeper into the design details. Um, we decided to categorize different aspects of the elevation design review for an easier and more comprehensible guideline format. And so those categories we broke them down into were streetscape and context considerations, site considerations, preservation and architecture considerations, and foundation design considerations. At this second workshop, we broke the panelists up into four groups to focus on those categories and develop the guidelines further. The panelists communicated that the guidelines should be simple and user-friendly, meant to guide not only architects and design professionals, um, but something that was educational for the general public and affected homeowners. Um, so in the next several slides, I'll go over the workshop results that essentially became our finalized uh, guidelines. So for streetscape and context considerations, essentially we just emphasize the importance of considering how an elevation will impact a building's relationship to the streetscape and how characteristic elements such as walls, fences, pathways could be incorporated to help it continue to relate. Also, a very important point was that a fir the first sister house to be elevated in a grouping shall instruct the elevation of fu future sister houses. So a high degree of scrutiny is applied to the quality of the design of the first sister house application. For site considerations, uh, keeping buildings in their original footprint was considered important since setting and location are part of what gives a building integrity. Important site features such as stairs, pathways, walls should also remain in place or go back in their existing configuration if they have to be removed through the elevation process. Um, buildings should not be moved to accommodate new, ex new additions or parking. However, if it is necessary to move the building which primarily has only happened to accommodate new stairs um, for the new height, um, that, sh that change should be minimized with low planning walls, fences and walls along the street to help keep that presence of where that building initially stood as an ode to its previous position. And I will say we have seen just a few applications where that building footprint um, you know, it has to be moved from its original footprint to accommodate new stairs just because the site is so constrained um, and there's just nowhere else for the stairs to go but in front of the building. And then, of course, we would want to see pervious materials and sufficient green space be used. So for preservation and architecture considerations, first, 
Through the elevation process, we highly discourage the destruction of character defining features and want to ensure that great lengths are taken to preserve them in place. So even piazza screens, uh, steps and railings like we saw with 42 Rutledge example. Chimneys have actually been a big topic of debate. And so there are options um, outlined for them in the guidelines. But actually, for the most part, we are seeing people elevating them with the house, um, which is excellent um, for maintaining that character defining feature. Stairs should incur in front of and within piazzas, which is the traditional configuration rather than extending out from the side of the piazza. And creative architectural devices should be used to mitigate the impact of elevation, uh, such as continuing the siding down the foundation to help reduce the, uh, the height, of the perceived height of the foundation, and perhaps lowering the window level to relate to existing patterns on the streetscape if appropriate. Sometimes that's not appropriate um, to change fenestration patterns in a historic building. And finally, uh, with historic buildings, when having to elevate significantly, the foundation should have the appearance of an additional floor, um, similarly to relate to the scale and patterns of the streetscape, you know, so that foundation level appears to be the first floor, which may relate to the first floor of the buildings next to it. And finally, foundation design considerations. Um, since we wanted elevating, elevated buildings to be compatible with our existing architectural character, Tall foundations should be based on historically elevated foundations. And further, they should be based on specific context examples. You know, in Charleston, while uh, we do have a similar character throughout our city, each neighborhood does have its specific treatments. And uh, the workshop, workshop group identified uh, the following specific features that are encouraged uh, to be incorporated into elevated foundations. Um, visual support for columns above, pilaster expression below columns, solid foundation under main body, piers at piazza, as we discussed, use of traditional masonry materials, and referencing existing materials and design of historic foundation and the new elevated foundation. We felt the elevated foundation should really just be an extension of the historic foundation. And so in that vein, in that vein when possible, reuse or match historic foundation materials. Uh, modern flood vents are rather unattractive and should be limited to the sides and rear of the house and not visible when possible. Um, and as discussed, using fenestration and openings to break up the expanse of the foundation is positive. And finally, parking underneath the buildings is highly discouraged, but may be acceptable um, if having to elevate that high anyway and can be accessed from the rear uh, where not visible. So the workshop, so following the workshop, uh, staff worked to organize and refine the feedback of the panelists, um, which pretty much translated to the points in the guidelines, and this is essentially what they look like. Uh, the result is a fairly simple document uh, that outlines the guidelines and uses example pictures to illustrate ex uh, those successful examples um, that I pointed out. Um, and with the adoption of this policy, it was formally in place that the BAR is supportive of elevating to what is necessary for FEMA. And thus far, um, an elevation application has not been denied by the BAR. It's really just a matter of tweaking the design to be as sensitive as possible for the building and the overall district. And that's really the goal of, of this document. So just to um, wrap up, I thought I'd show you where you could access these guidelines if you were interested. You can find them on the city's website on the BAR webpage. Um, toward the bottom of the web page, but I would be happy to follow up with anyone afterward to get you the document. And finally, since we are a few years out from when these guidelines were adopted, I do have a few examples of some completed projects to show you. Um, so the first one is 42 Rutledge, the very first project that ever came forward, you know, in the past few years. And as you can see, uh, the before and after is visually not a great difference. Um, the biggest change you can see is in the increase of, in height in the foundation and the piazza, piazza screen. 
like I showed you, the Piazza screen did stay in place and just about every piece of historic fabric was kept on the building, which is very positive. This is an interesting example. This is a house in our east side neighborhood in an area that floods particularly bad on a regular basis. Uh, sunny day, high tide flooding is, is an issue here. Um, this building is a sister house, as you can see. Um, it's one of the earlier houses in the area from the mid 19th century. Um, because flooding issues are so bad here, this house actually came forward, I believe two or three times before the guidelines were adopted, uh, requesting to elevate, um, I believe between 2011 and 2014, they came and asked the BAR to elevate and each time they were denied because they were a sister house, because of the significance of the age of the house in the context, um, it, it was denied. However, with this big shift and you know the the change uh, with the city in, in supporting elevating buildings, they came forward again in 2018 and they were approved. And based on the guidelines, um, you know this elevation project um, was subject to high scrutiny because it is a sister house. Um, and if this house were to come forward in the future requesting to elevate, they would have to base their design off of this house. Here's one that's actually underway at the moment. It's on Queen Street, just around the corner from 42 Rutledge, the first house we saw. Um, this one is a little bit unique. Um, typically we, we see um, Piazza screens being kept in place in their current elevation. However, this one was allowed to elevate with the house um, with a new set of stairs extending down and uh, the reason that was approved is because it was set back from the street a bit more than a typical single house. And there was precedent on the street in particular, the neighboring house did have a similar stair condition. Uh, so that was allowed to be approved here like that. And finally, uh, this one is on Savage Street, South Abroad. This is another one of the first ones to be elevated. I believe maybe it was one of the very next ones after 42 Rutledge. And I have to say this one is probably the best um, elevation I've seen. I think in terms of craftsmanship, attention to detail, I think they executed this one really well. Um, this is uh, one of a, a, a sister house and a grouping, um, but just the way that they executed the brick, piers, the stucco, the woodwork, it just really turned out well. Um, but as you can see, there certainly is quite a bit of height difference between this building and its sisters. And there's about three others to the right of it here. And we will continue to see conditions like this until more buildings are elevated. But that is something the BAR has communicated is acceptable as long as we see, you know, the elevate, elevations executed um, to the to the level of this one here. It's it's that's the whole point of the guidelines. Um, so I think that's just about everything I had to share with you today. And I would be very happy to answer some questions. Thanks so much, Erin. That was great. Um, I see we have a couple of questions or a question that's come in already. And anybody else, if you have any other questions, um, please send them through the chat or you can email them to me or message them to me. Um, Peter asks, does Charleston have building height limits? And if so, how did you modify them and what sort of opposition did you get? We w actually went through a process um, a few years before the elevation design guidelines to modify height limits in the city. And we now have height limits based on stories. Um, so that was a process separate from elevating buildings. Um, and really they don't interact too much. Uh, for instance, say we had a two-story building in a two-story height district that had to be elevated that might put it up to two and a half or three stories. So, um, it would be acceptable to allow them to elevate that far and utilize them by having to take off a story of their house um, to go up that far for FEMA requirements. Um, 
So I'm just making sure. So really the, the story uh, height limits really operate separately from the, the elevation. Okay. Um, and Penny asks, have people who raised their buildings before the guidelines, who maybe had sort of inappropriate or I guess non-conforming results, made any changes after the fact? Right. So there are really little to no examples of buildings that were elevated prior to the guideline. Um, so there were maybe just a handful of buildings that may have been elevated after Hugo. Um, very rare examples. Traditionally, the BAR denied elevating buildings, especially within the past maybe 20, 20 years. Um, so 42 Rutledge was the very first example in recent history that went up, and that was scrutinized heavily. Uh, so, you know, fortunately, there aren't many bad examples of elevated buildings because they all have had to conform to this um, you know, kind of guideline mindset. They're somewhat similar, which, uh, oh, sorry, there's a new question that just bumped it up to uh, two questions sort of about the infrastructure as the town of plans, uh, these streets and sidewalks, given the predictions for the high number of flooding days. Um, and I think Amanda's question is, is similar as well. Okay. No plans to elevate streets or sidewalks that I know of, um, at least uh, in the context of downtown. The biggest uh, infrastructure plan on the horizon is the Army Corps is undergo undergoing this uh, study right now. Um, it's called the three by three study, uh, three years at $3 million dollars. Um, to study storm surge solutions for Charleston. And they've put forward their recommended plan, which is a 12 foot storm surge wall that encircles the peninsula. Um, so that does not include elevating streets, sidewalks or anything like that. They would be putting in place this wall and various gates um, that would be locked during times of, of storms. Um, and that that's just in the preliminary stages right now. Um, it would be dependent on funding um, as well as community buy-in. Um, so we'll see if that happens, but that's probably the biggest proposal to come forward in terms of. Very interesting. Um, Timothy asks, what are Charleston's predominant soil types and how do they compare to those on Nantucket? And uh, Jen Carberg or any other natural people can correct me, but I believe we are mostly sand. Yes. <laughs> Do you know what Charleston soil types are? I don't, but I'd probably have to say similar to Nantucket. <laughs> no, I, I unfortunately am not familiar. Well, if any of the natural science people want to message yes. Timothy, that would be great. Uh, and Deanne asks, um, are most, if not are all, of Charleston structures on their historic structures on their original foundations, which I think goes back to your earlier answer about not a lot of was happening at all prior to the groundswell movement. That's right. Yes, um, and of course, you know, buildings have been modified heavily over time, um, so we do see you know strange foundations that you know have been added on to, modified, you know, redone. But the goal is to, you know, with a with an elevated foundation to try um, to emulate its historic configuration and material as much as possible. It's so like I said, we, we did go round and round on that, especially um, through the lens of the Secretary of Interior Standards. Doesn't, is a new foundation a new addition? Um, and really, we did end up deciding, no, we feel like it's an extension of that historic feature and we want it to um, emulate the historic uh, design. So, yeah, to the, to the greatest extent possible, you know, trying to match what we can tell is the historic foundation material. Great. Uh, Sarah asks if you have any commercial building um, examples or whether commercial buildings or other institutional buildings that are... Um, no, I don't. 
so far, only residential uh, applications have come forward. There was one corner store that um, indicated interest in elevating, but I don't think that went very far. Uh, just the logistics of, of how to do that, I think, just became too difficult. Um, luckily, commercial buildings are able to flood proof in place, um, so they don't have to elevate. Any opposition uh, to, to folks wanting to lift their structures? Great question. And uh, I actually had thought about this um, just the other day. To my recollection, I don't remember any opposition. In fact, um, it was really the community that was pushing for the city to do something about, um, you know, the flood issues, addressing, uh, you know, allowing homeowners to do something for their flooded properties. Um, and in fact, this group formed called Groundswell here in Charleston um, that led the charge on that. And uh, they, they, they were really the ones that advocated for us to, to put in a policy, um, you know, set, set a policy that, that would allow homeowners to elevate their buildings. So no, I don't think there was any opposition from the community. They were very much on board And do you know if any homeowners applied for and whether any FEMA provided funding? Was there any FEMA funding available to folks who lifted their homes? And, and another quite similar question, is there any financial assistance? And what is the cost to do some of the work that you've shown us? Um, great question. Um, FEMA financial assistance is the only that I I know about um, out there and available. And I only know of, I believe, two properties that downtown that received FEMA financial assistance. Um, and I don't know to what extent um, tried to find that out and it was not easy to come across that information. Um, as to how much, I have heard a wide range of how much this can cost. Um, but tens of thousands of dollars, um, 30,000 or more is generally what I, what I hear. Insignificant amount, certainly. Does anybody have any other questions for Aaron? We can maybe take a couple more. Thomas asks, our hope is to preserve communities that developed long before anybody thought about rising sea levels, um, which is true. What if any structural or design styles have been proven to be simply untenable in this new world of rising sea levels? I think we might get into some of that more um, in the program over the next couple of days. But do you have any thoughts about that? I'm so sorry. Would you mind repeating the question? I'm, I think I sure. may. All, all of these issues. All of, all, Thomas writes. All of these issues are, are in our attempts to fight Mother Nature. Understandably, our hope is to preserve communities that developed long before anybody thought about rising sea levels. What if any structural or design styles have proven to be simply untenable in this new world of rising sea levels? Mm -hmm. Seems like the ones that are on the ground. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, slab on grade <laughs> seems to be the biggest challenge, which I don't come across here often in Charleston. Um, when I worked in St. Augustine, Florida, that was a major issue. Um, some of our mid-century uh, neighborhoods that were built kind of on like barrier islands on sand, uh, those were really difficult challenges because you can't raise those and and um, those flooded constantly just because they were built in areas that flooded and we were experiencing uh, you know the, that period of time between 2015 and 2017 seemed to just be hurricane after hurricane um, and those poor people just couldn't live in their homes because they were constantly flooding um, that's what course in mind <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, and Hillary asks, she says, 
architecture, architecture appears to accommodate thoughtful elevation, which I would agree with. Some of those examples mm -hmm. were really um, thought, nicely blended. Uh, if the vernacular architecture makes elevation challenging, what other options exist for protecting structures? That's a great question. Um, and something we have been grappling with here a lot that we've seen not just elevation requests come forward, but a lot of other creative requests for trying to deal with flooding on properties and trying to avoid elevating. Um, people have um, tried temporary flood barriers around their properties, um, installing masonry walls around their properties with, um, you know, temporary dropping gates, you know, where their driveways and pedestrian gates are. Um, we've, we've even seen some technologies come forward that, you know, uh, inflate under the house in times during storms um, to, you know, let the house lift up with the water and then come back down. So I think there's a lot of new uh, ideas out there and we're, we're kind of sifting through them just to see what works best. Um, and, and we'll see what, what happens in the future. Um, but, for, but for now, you know, we're, we're trying to be as flexible um, as and with homeowners to allow them to con continue living and using their properties um, because the best thing for a historic building is its continued use. Thanks. I think we're going to take these last couple questions. Mary asks, are all the elevations private or are there public buildings? I think you answered that when you were talking about the corner store as a potential lift, but everything else had been private. Yeah, so far just private residential, um, but who knows in the future. Penny asks, what about cemeteries? Great question. We actually have um, a significant uh, historic cemetery that's listed on the National Register, uh, Magnolia Cemetery, for those who are interested. Um, that is right up on the marsh in Charleston. Uh, it already is starting to experience flooding issues. Uh, the wall that I referenced earlier by the Army Corps, they have deemed, you know, the cemetery not important enough to include inside the wall. So um, I'll just say it's kind of a big question of what we're going to have to do about the cemetery because um, we're coming up pretty fast on some issues in terms of erosion of the marsh and sea level rise and constant flooding. Um, and I don't have an answer of how that's gonna be handled, but we're, we're trying to figure it out. That sounds like a, another challenge entirely. And Margaret asks, has there been any forward thinking within the National Historic Preservation the National Trust for Historic Preservation towards their policy changes for lifting and even and even moving structures. So I guess, yeah, referencing that usually the thinking was you don't want to separate a building from its foundation. Exactly. That's a great question. Um, I know the National Park Service has put out guidelines on, you know, adapting historic buildings, um, you know, for climate change um, and sea level rise. Um, and that's a pretty groundbreaking policy that they've that they've put out. I don't know about the National Trust and, and what they're doing in that context, um, but um, I think slowly all of these organizations um, are, are getting on board and trying to wrap their mind around, you know, this, this future we have ahead of us. Well, thank you, Erin. Um, I think we could probably ask you another hour's worth of questions. <laughs> uh, that we'll want to take a little bit break before we have our next presentation at 1030 uh, with Elise okay. Lee. So thank you so much. And folks, Aaron's email address is there on the slide, Minigan at preservationsociety.org if you have other questions. And just thank you so much for kicking this off. This was really informative and we'll get you up to Nantucket someday. <laughs> yes, that would be great. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. Folks, we'll see you in uh, 15 minutes.